Great. <laughs> so uh, Peter has just come on camera um, and I'm pleased to welcome him. He is a conflict resolution professional who's worked very closely with Dr. Morton Deutsch, um, one of the preeminent figures in the fields of cooperation, social justice and conflict resolution. Like Mort, Peter believes in the power of big ideas to change our world for the better and the critical role of science to refine our understanding of such ideas. Peter has known and supported the important work of Evelyn and Linda and you all for many years and sees human dignity as a central idea. He received the Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies Lifetime Commitment Award in 2020, as Evelyn had mentioned. Um, he's a proud father and devoted dog owner of Louie, who may join us today, I hope. <laughs> and um, we should note that he really loves cake. So let's have a cake together right. next time, right. next year, when we can all be together at Teachers College. Thank well, you, Danielle. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody uh, from around the world. So fantastic to see you or see your names, at least at this point. Um, Linda or someone, I need to be able to share my screen if that's possible. And it's, I, I don't think I can yet. So can you enable that if that's possible? Uh, it should be enabled, actually. Let me check. All right. I'm sorry to be the voice in the background, but it should be enabled. Let's double check. All right. Ah, okay. I'm there I am. Okay. I think I got it now. Can people see this? Yes. Fantastic. Oh, that somehow that stopped. Let me try again. All right, very good. Um, great. So again, so good to have all be with all of you here um, and to share some information. So this uh, this will be a bit of a rapid fire talk. I want to talk about a lot of work that we've been doing over the past few years. Um, it's actually based on 25 years of research, but specifically focused on political polarization or or polarization across different kinds of differences, um, a phenomenon happening, of course, around the world. Uh, this book, The Way Out, was written and focused on the U.S. And I'll explain why in a minute. But uh, it is talking about something called toxic polarization and how to overcome it. Um, and so uh, I'll move quickly and then I'll re uh, refer you to a couple of websites and uh, invite you to be in conversation with us around this work, both the science behind it and some of the practice that's uh, unfolding right now. But I just wanna talk briefly about what this, what we mean by a state of toxic polarization, a little bit about how we got stuck on this multi-decade trajectory, and then mostly focus on what to do about it. That's what the book is about. That's what a lot of the applied efforts uh, are about. Um, but let me give you some re recent statistics here. So right now, one in four Americans feel so alienated from the government that they believe it may soon be necessary to take up arms against the government. A majority of us agree that the government is corrupt and rigged against everyday people like me. 40% of Americans see our best days in the past, and a majority of us overwhelmingly agree that the greatest threat to the US today comes from um, people within the country. It's not climate change, it's not guns, it's not you know the economy or inequality, it's them. It's the other group that is the biggest obstruction and the, and the biggest threat to the country. Um, and this has led to this kind of state where 80% of Biden supporters, 84% of Trump supporters, view elected officials from the other party as, quote, presenting a clear and present danger to American democracy. And I just want you to be mindful of that language, uh, because that is an extremely concerning statement um, for a majority of these voters to express towards the other side. 40% of Biden voters, 50% of Trump voters favor their states seceding from the union to form their own separate country. About 30% of Republicans and 11% of Democrats feel ready to resort to violence to save this country. That's about 30, approximately 30 million Americans that 
report being ready to fight in a country with at least 400 million guns that we know of. There are only 330 million people approximately here and over 400 million guns that we know of uh, in circulation in this country. So it's a very well-armed state. This has led uh, people like John Meacham and Doris Kearns Goodwin, who are noted historians, to really draw parallels today in the U.S. to the 1850s in the U.S., right before the U.S. Civil War, because of the secessionist um, sentiments, because of the major disinformation campaigns that are being wielded, uh, and because of the profound distrust in the government uh, and in our electoral process. Um, so it's a, it's a very dire time here. This is not new to us. This has been increasing. Our political polarization has been increasing. This is voting in Congress uh, since 1879. And the higher levels are more obstructionism in Congress and more polarization. And it started to increase uh, around the 1970s uh, and continues to today. Um, and America is exceptional in this way. So there was a recent study that came out looking at these different areas of the world. And there are upticks in political polarization in many of them. But, but here, uh, it is the most extreme. Um, and so one wonders why that is. And that's what we're trying to understand. And that's why the book is focused on America as a cautionary tale for others around the world. I want to stress that polarization is just a phenomenon that's found in nature and science. It's when there are sort of two poles that either attract certain elements or repulse or repel certain elements. Um, so it's really a natural phenomenon. And positive political polarization is a good thing in a two-party system like ours. You want to have you know, energized true believers who have, you know, insight and very, very different positions on policy issues that challenge each other and ideally achieve better uh, policies and ideas um, moving forward. Uh, in the 1950s here, there was a concern that there was a lack of polarization, that the parties were too co cozy and comfortable and overlapping in, their, in terms of their policies. Um, but today we are in a state where we look more like this. This is a a, um, a view of Twitter exchanges between red uh, Republican conservative Americans and blue more democratic um, liberal Americans. And part of what you see here is that blue talks to blue and red talks to red and there's very little contact or communication between them um, other than disparaging remarks and vitriol. So this is the state of our uh, polarization, which is extreme and is continuing to get extreme. And it's it's measurable and visible on many levels, including the simple fact that red and blue Americans are physically moving away from one another, not just into rural urban divides, but, but even within cities, you see neighborhoods that are becoming um, more and more clusters of one or the other. Of the 3,030 counties in this country, um, I think only 2% of them are considered purple. The rest are clustered into these more coherent political partisan groups, which is a, a condition that's very concerning to people that study, you know, ethnic violence and political violence. Um, but this is a recipe for bad news. Why we get stuck is part of what the first or second chapter of the book is about. If you, if you look at accounts, scientific accounts, research on polarization, there are many micro level factors that people point to. Some Americans or some conservative uh, minds tend to be much more sensitive to threat stimuli, threat messaging than liberals. You know, there are human ethnocentric tendencies and you know, rise in loneliness in this country and alienation and, you know, distrust in major institutions. And so people are looking for belonging to, in their political groups. A variety of different micro level factors, as well as many macro level factors. The simple party that we have a two party winner takes all system, government is dysfunctional, negative political campaigning is very popular. Um, so there are a variety of factors that people, many scholars will identify as the key reason why we're so stuck. 
I argue that none of these explain the multi-decade runaway train we're on, that it's a combination of these things. And more importantly, it's how they start to feed each other and align in complex ways that are sometimes hard to understand. But if we have a particular attitude, you know, that's negative about an outgroup, we'll prefer media that encourages that, that supports that, that is comforting to us. And that starts to change neural pathways in our brain. Therefore, it's even more difficult and effortful to process contrary or contradictory information. And so these things start to work. And this is just a simple piece of it. But the truth is that there are multiple factors that are working in concert to pull us apart. And in this way, what I liken our current state of toxic political polarization to is like a, like a mass addiction. This is a biopsychosocial structural problem. It's within our you know, neurological structures. It's within our relationships, our psychology, our networks, who we do talk to and don't talk to, where we feel comfortable, where we, the places we avoid, where we travel, where we don't. And then of course, the media that we attend to or don't attend to, the social media algorithms. There are a variety of different factors that are working together to pit us against each other and pull us apart. Um, and what does tend to happen over time is that these kinds of problems, you know, scare us. We don't understand them. Karl Popper, um, noted philosopher of science, called these kinds of problems cloud problems. He said in the world, there are kind of two categories of, of problems in science and life. One are clock problems. And we tend to think about most problems as clock problems, things that you can break apart and identify the cause and fix it and repair it. Um, and there are many problems that are clock-like in our world, but that some of our more major societal problems are what he referred to as cloud problems, where you have constellations of factors operating in strange ways, having strange types of interactions. And so when you go in with a well-intentioned intervention to try to help people, for example, just talk things out, it doesn't have the kind, kinds of effects that we would anticipate because there are too many other things, compensatory factors that are affecting it. And so how we understand these cloud problems is very important. And it really does require um, that we think about them differently because not only are they complicated and dynamic changing all the time, but what they do tend to do sometimes is settle into very strong patterns. These different factors create sort of psychological landscapes for us or social psychological landscapes for us that make it very easy to fall into conflict, to be triggered, to be triggered by outrage, by something expressed on Twitter, something we see on the news, something a neighbor says, you know, it becomes easier and easier just to fall into this trap and harder and harder to, to uh, extricate ourselves from it. So it requires that we think about these kinds of problems, these long-term conflicts that become more and more, where we become more and more estranged from one another, but we think about them differently. Um, so we've been studying this for a long time. We call these kinds of long-term conflicts intractable conflicts. We've uh, done a lot of research on these and published a lot of uh, sort of books. And the way out is the most recent application of this type of science. It's a combination of complexity science, psychology, and then peace and conflict studies and integrates those into a, a different way of thinking about these problems. Um, and so what I want to say, talk about is the good news. <laughs> so, and again, I have no idea how much time I have, but I'm going to keep going. Um, the good news is that when we study deeply divided societies and the conditions under which they actually stop and pivot and choose a different course, there are a few common conditions that increase the chances that that will happen. And one is that you have to have enough people that are miserable. Enough of our citizenry have to be fed up and exhausted and really want wanting a change. They not are not happy with the status quo. And the good news here is that Americans are miserable. This there's research by the um, um, uh, by the Hidden Tribes uh, studies um, and by Pew that have consistently found that. There are different groups that are responding differently to our climate of political vitriol 
There are the more extreme groups that get most of the attention and that capture most of the discourse on social media and oftentimes mainstream media. But there are many groups, hidden tribes that are referred to. Uh, um, more in common is the group that does this research. Um, and they are you know, less engaged, um, but also exhausted and fed up and really, and it's and the numbers are somewhere between 67 and 93%, depending on when they measure it, but the vast majority of Americans are fed up and exhausted and really looking for something different, which given the trajectory we're on, we're, we are on is good news. But in addition to being fed up, it's also useful when societies are sufficiently destabilized and starting to question their basic assumptions about what they value and how they treat their neighbors and who they blame for things. And fortunately, again, ironically, COVID and the crises around COVID, the uh, racial injustice, um, awareness of racial injustice that our country has begun to, con you know, continues to struggle with, but our awareness of that has increased in recent years. Um, economic downturns, there's a, a variety of factors that are very destabilizing in our society. And what research on when conflicts like this change tell us is that that's a good thing, that that kind of instability starts to encourage people to question how they live their life, what their priorities are, what their values are. Um, and we even see this last year, 47 million Americans voluntarily quit their job right? So they weren't forced to or didn't lose it. But about a third of the workforce said, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do something else. And that suggests that there is a time of reckoning about how we live our lives. And that that is that in some ways we're ripe for a change. But the third thing we need is a sense of what to do. What is the alternative? We live our lives the way we do. And yes, we may be exhausted and destabilized, but what what does it look like? And that's what this book was written about. It suggests that this dynamic of toxic polarization that many of us are sucked into and trapped in can be counteracted by a variety of really five basic scientific principles that research has told us um, are the conditions, help create the conditions for people, families, communities, and societies to change, to change course. Um, it's hard work, but it's not impossible. And that's what this book is about. Each chapter in the book covers one of these. Um, but the begin, the first is that, you know, this is like an AA when there is a, an addiction. It's important for the uh, addict uh, to stop and either be confronted by their family or feel like they've hit bottom and really start to reflect about what, how do I change this? How do I change the people, places, and things in my life? So that's one of the main recommendations that we have is that, you know, life is such a whirlwind these days, and many of us really need to sort of stop and start to question. And what we find from the study of these complex problems, complex systems, is that in times like this of great instability, the first next moves we make can really matter. And so this chapter outlines a lot of things to consider when you begin to imagine a different way forward. And so one is simply to question your own intentions in encounters across the divide or even within, within your own tribe. How are you contributing to the problem? Um, another is just to think about uh, what are your assumptions about change? And this comes from research that is in Israel, has been conducted in Israel-Palestine by Aaron Helper and Carol Dweck and others. And what they found is that when Israelis, for example, believe that the conflict is never going to change, Palestinians are never going to change, Israelis are never going to change, then that basically leaves them with two options. You either you would disengage from the conflict, if at all possible, or if you have to engage, you fight. Those are your options. If you believe that things, the status quo will never change. But when you start to feel that there's a possibility, actually, that they might change, you hear a Palestinian talking, about that they used to you know, advocate for violence and now they're working for peace and they're concerned about their children and grandchildren. When you start to hear about a malleability, a willingness to change and shift, particularly on the other side, it does elicit in us a different kind of feeling of possibility and a different way of engaging. 
Um, so this is just one of the recommendations to think about in your reset as you stop and reflect about how to proceed. Um, the next is what we call, well, spotting po positive deviance. This is very similar to appreciative inquiry that Linda was re referencing earlier. Um, and this is the idea that, you know, oftentimes when there are difficult conflicts, complicated long-term conflicts, our tendency is to kind of go in and again, introduce a fix and come in from the outside and fix things. And what we find in these kinds of problems is that you want to basically begin with what already works. You want to do what a, my colleague, Laura Chasen used to call finding the networks of effective action. This network is one of them, right? So who are the people? the groups, the organizations in a particular community who know already how to navigate these divisions and are effectively working to bridge the divide, keep people in communication, keep building compassion for one another. Who are they? And can you somehow support and scale up what is already there? It's what I call the, the community um, autoimmune systems that are there trying to fight hate and vitriol already. It's not a new thing you wanna introduce it's an existing element within the community. The good news here in the US is that Princeton has a initiative called the Bridging Divides Initiative. They spent the past few years mapping all of the bridge building organizations at the community level across the country. And this map is interactive. You can go to it, you can zoom in on a particular area and it will tell you in that area where the existing bridge building organizations are, what they focus on, how they work, and it invites you to engage more locally with these groups that are what we would call positive deviants. Third, third principle, I'm trying to go as fast as I can, is mm -hmm. to complicate your life. And this argues that, you know, what does tend to happen with us in situations that feel threatening and we feel outraged by things that the other side says or does, is that we oftentimes really prematurely simplify close ranks into us and them, and that becomes a very chronic dynamic. And the one thing that can counteract that is if we intentionally complicate our life, if we develop new habits of, of thinking and feeling and acting and living that allow us to tolerate and learn from our contradictions, our own contradictions, their contradictions, nuance and opposing views before we act, before we move forward. So one example of this uh, is the role of media. This is a colleague of mine, Amanda Ripley, who's written about this, works, for a group, works with a group called Solutions Journalism. And she wrote this piece for reporters because her position is that the media, this is mainstream reporting, um, contributes largely to political polarization because of how they do their work. That you, if there's a story uh, that they want to cover, they try to find two sides that are, you know, controversial and and contentious and dramatic because that gets attention, and capture those two sides, and that's the business model of a lot of mainstream media, and that contributes to the problem. So what they're trying to do is think about how do you present the reality of these very complex issues such as immigration, you know, healthcare. These are immensely complicated policy issues, and we simplify them with sort of, you know, titles and labels. So how can reporters do their work in a way that's still compelling and feasible, but that encourages uh, complicating the narrative? Um, another uh, component that I want to stress is the idea of um, movement. And this is to some of us uh, in the peace building world is uh, not that familiar to others. It may be more familiar, but typically as a media mediator, we are trained to bring disputants in, have them sit at a table across from each other and to talk. And most of the time that's very useful. It's very helpful. There's a good facilitated process. We can learn a lot and unpack things, but sometimes with some conflicts, when the divisions are embedded in our neurological structures, they're really in how we process information, what information we can and can't process, then we oftentimes need additional help to get people to open up and consider different ways of thinking and feeling and understanding one another. And what we found from neuroscience research is that movement, physical movement, also psychological movement, imagination, but physical movement 
is one way to help us break free of ingrained patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving. Um, and so one of the things we recommend is that if there's a division you're experiencing in your family or your community with another, one way to move out of patterns that are ingrained in your dynamics is to go for a walk. So I did this this summer with a neighbor of mine who um, is far on the other side of the political uh, divide than I am. We had become sort of estranged, even though I, I, I knew him to be a decent person. And so I contacted him and said, would you take a walk with me in the park? Because one of the things we've learned from research is that when people move together physically, side by side, ideal, ideally outside, there is something about the physical nature of that that helps, encourages people to move in sync and feel a more of a sense of connection and compassion uh, to one another, which is not the, a magic bullet, but it creates better conditions for at least agreeing to disagree. So this chapter in the book cites a variety of possible, possible ways of enacting that, but this is just one example. There is, by the way, the Abraham Path, which some of you may be familiar with, but this is a, a multi-denominational space that tr tracks the trek of Abraham in his time with his family and has created a space uh, for people to walk together, ideally in multi-denominational groups, with the idea that that movement, that physical journey, is a way to connect in a very different uh, kind of way. Um, and then the last piece I'll say conceptually is just that this, these are hard problems. These are long-term problems. There are no simple, quick solutions to this. This has taken decades for us to get in, in America to, into these patterns and other nations as well, other societies as well. And so uh, getting out of this is going to be dif difficult and it's really going to require a more sort of adaptive way of thinking and working. And so the, the, the lesson here is to expect setbacks. This is going to, we have to sort of take a long view of what we're trying to do, how we best do it, learn what we can from good effective decision-making uh, research in complex environments. And one a shout out I want to give is to Dietrich Dorner's work on this, this tremendous book called The Logic of Failures, a German psychologist um, who studied, you know, well-intentioned people trying to solve problems like this. This is a game of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is very complex and very hard, hard to navigate. But, but Dorner studied things like this. We've studied things like this in the lab. And again, there are certain components to how to navigate setbacks, navigate surprising effects, the unintended consequences of well-intentioned actions in our life um, and learn from them and pivot and continue. And that's the sort of lesson here is that this work is hard, but not impossible. Okay, so I wrote this book, we published it in, Ju in June, 2021. Um, you know, it's been great. I've been talking a lot about it uh, in many places. But the reality is very few people read books, right, and or science. Um, and so we've been trying to think about how, how do we start to offer some of these ideas and engage people in ways that are not necessarily workshops or classes or academic-like things. Even popular articles sometimes just feel inaccessible to many, many people. So we've been creating and working on developing what we call a four-week challenge. And this is a set of, you know, five-minute exercises all the way up to, you know, hours of exercises that people can take. They kind of commit to do it, ideally in groups for a few weeks. We piloted it this summer. We uh, have launched it on a website that I'll tell you about. Um, and it takes the principles but it kind of breaks it down and says, all right, if you really want to do this in your life, how do you start? And we recommend that you start small, that you commit to for a week doing one thing that takes five minutes a day. And these are small nudges that help you start to work. And we've done this because so much of this, of the bridge building work that's done, which is well-intentioned and is really promising, suffers from three problems. One is that it is many of these dialogue groups, bridge building groups, assume that contact between members of different groups is always good. 
And what the science has told us consistently is it's only good when there are major ideological divisions under certain conditions. And those conditions are often not met sufficiently in dialogue groups. In addition, in this country, the participation in those groups is very democratic. It's very lopsided, one-sided, very hard to get conservatives to buy into this. They feel they're very suspicious of it. They see it as a blue agenda. And most of them are short term. Most of them are, uh, you know, a two hour conversation or an hour and a half dinner or a 40 minute thing online, or there are these episodes, which are not meaningless, but they're insufficient to the problem. And we've known that from research on contact theory for year, years is that it, the, the degree of exposure you have to the other friendships that develop breakfasts that happen once a week, these ongoing things are much more likely eventually to move people into a different place. So we're trying to develop something which will allow us or help us to spark a kind of cultural political movement, tapping into the you know, anxiety and dread of 86% of Americans. And we do it by offering this kind of four week set of resources, starting week one where you focus on you and your inclinations and your attitudes and your you know what triggers you and sort of a mindfulness around you but then moving into relationships that have become tense or distance because of po politics, working then the third week into your in-group and the difficulty you may have being honest and candid within your in-group, and then eventually moving you into some kind of action. How could a group like yours, whether it's a work group or a friend group or a family group, um, agree to something that you could do together to start to address a particular issue that's divisive in your life or in your community. So what happens for these weeks is that each day you're offered a set of options from five minutes to longer, um, where you can either begin to focus on you or you, you know, stop, you spot positive deviants, you complicate, you move, you adapt next week into your relationships, next week working in your in-group, uh, and then scaling up to working at the community or even national level issues. Um, and we've piloted this and it's been pretty effective so far. We are building partnerships with all of these groups. These are some of the major bridge building groups in the country, Search for Common Ground, Listen First Project, Braver Angels. Um, uh, to, and, and part of what we keep saying to them is what we believe is this challenge doesn't compete with what you do. It can enhance what you do. Because if you're Braver Angels and you're bringing people together for two hour dinners, that's fantastic. But then what? Can you use this as preparation for those dinners? Can you use it for ex activities and exercises after the dinners? How do we start to connect the dots with all the good work that's being done and enhance it through this other kind of mechanism? This group that I work, I'm partnering with called Starts With Us put out a, a, a social media teaser challenge on this uh, uh, the week before our midterm elections. They gave people in across social media one little exercise, five minutes each day. They got something like a million impressions on social media. I don't really know what that means, but it sounds impressive. Um, but it is an attempt to get mostly younger people aware of the availability of the full challenge and enacting it. So that's where I'll, I'll leave the conversation is that I'll say that on the website for the book, which is on the left, um, and on the website for the challenge, which is on the right, um, are these offerings. Um, the, the website for the book has a lot of media and you know, articles and videos and talks that I've given, um, but the, uh, the website for the challenge is an introduction to what this could be. And our hope is that it's something that could be adopted and adapted by different groups. So it might be something that the, the um, uh, humanity, uh, so, sorry, <laughs> that the human dignity group adopts and says, let's try this, but let's adapt it to how we work. Or the Rotary Clubs may do that. Or Nike may say, we're having political divisions within our corporation and we want people to start to talk to each other in a different way about these things. How do we do that? These can all be adapted um, to different kinds of groups, different kinds of audiences following the science but there's enough flexibility in how they do it. And that's one of the great learnings we had this summer when we piloted this is that 
the, the students that I was working with were much more creative than I. And so they came up with ideas. They said, well, we, I know what we want to do this day. You know, I know what the science is for this day, but I don't like these exercises. What I want to do is reach out, reach out to a New York City hostage negotiator who I know and take a walk with them and learn from them about how do you talk to people and reason with people that have that live in a, a parallel universe from you. So the creative aspect and the flexible aspect of the challenge we think is important. We invite you to you know to explore these and to communicate with us and stay in, in touch. Um, Linda, I'll leave it at that and turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Peter. I can't tell you what a highlight it's been to listen to your talk and, and also how affirming it is for what we've been trying to do for the last uh, decade, multiple decades, just bridge building, finding effective networks, supporting the people that are taking this dignity work out in the world. And you know, now I'm so happy we can add your work and we have a clear sense of how we can share this with others in our community and through our work, Peter. So I can't thank you enough. I have to give you a big round of applause. Thank you for sure. being here. We're looking forward to doing more with you, but, and we're also looking forward to having conversations in our small group about your talk and meet and greet. But before we go to that, we'd love to get a picture with you and Danielle. And so I'm gonna invite everyone who wishes to be part of that picture to turn on your cameras. This is our way to thank Peter for this wonderful presentation. It was so powerful, such an important topic. And we'll go to the gallery view. Great, and we'll have our photographers take some shots. Are you ready? This is our big thank you to Danielle Kuhn and Peter Coleman and Columbia University Morton Deutsch International Center for Cooperation and Conflict Resolution for being our institutional inspiration for so much of the work that we do. So give them a round of applause. Mm -hmm. Give them a little heart sign. We'll give you the full load. Put up your sticker. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter and Danielle. What a pleasure to have you with us. And what an inspiration for the rest of our workshop. We're Our looking pleasure. forward to doing more. Thank you, Great. Danielle. Thank you, Peter. My pleasure. I know Peter Thank you. <clears throat>